All right, well, welcome to Chase Oaks Church, whether you are online, wherever you are right now, or here at our Legacy Campus Friday Nighters. Special group of people, Friday Nighters, aren't we? So, uh, so glad you're here. And we are in week two of Reimagine, this series that is more than a series, it's really an adventure that he has launched by the series, but will sort of be this journey we're on for the next uh, 10 or so years as we seek to reimagine our church to reach a whole new cultural situation, a whole new generation. And, uh, and we believe God is always at work and he's calling us to take some big steps. And you are here, I believe, because you're indispensable to that. Where's Peter? He's not here right now. But, uh, but you are indispensable. And it, it is, you know, sometimes you might think that some are more, dis, you know, indispensable than others. Like um, this past week, um, I don't know if you heard about this thing that happened on Monday, the eclipse. Did you hear about that? And uh, which I thought that was cool for reimagine that God thought it was a big enough deal to just do that for us at the beginning of the adventure. And at least that's my interpretation of why God did that. Never let the truth get in the way of a self-serving theory, right? So, but we were watching, um, this, this, here's our staff, uh, some of our staff we were watching at the Legacy Campus. And, um, and you know, everybody's looking up with their glasses, right? Well, shortly after that totality hit, which was like so incredible. And, and when you know, everybody was looking up, right, in, in that time, and somebody said on the staff, because Gene Getz was there, our founding pastor was there, and um, somebody said, oh, because well, we're all looking up, I wonder if the raptures happened because of that thing, right? And the rapture, for those who don't know, is uh, when, but when Jesus returns, and there's different theories about exactly when and how, but when Jesus returns, uh, Thessalonians says that we will be caught up with the Lord in the air, that we will kind of be zapped up at the return and then come down with him. And, uh, and so somebody said, oh, do you, we think the rapture happened? And, uh, and then somebody said, oh, no, Gene Getz is still here, <laughs> which is great. But they didn't say Jeff Jones is still here. <laughs> they said Gene Getz is still. So some may be more indispensable than others, right? But actually, we all are. And, and that, that's the word of the day is, is indispensable. You know, last week when I did this, we said, do you remember what we said? Whoa, baby. Here we go, right? And that's going to be kind of a theme through this series. But just today, when I say this, I want us to say indispensable. So here we go. Indispensable. Because whether you realize it or not, you really are. It's the way God has decided to work in the world is not just push us out of the way and say, yes, yeah, see you later. Let me do it. He uses you and me. And a question I want us to think about right now is this question. What if everyone around you adjacent to your life and your relational circle was one step, one conversation, one act of love, one invitation away from his or her life being changed forever. Because that's true. That God has placed you where he's placed you, where you live, where you work, where you play, where you go to school, uh, where, everywhere he, ha he has you, he has you there because he loves the people adjacent to your life so much that he put you there and they don't know it but they're just one small step away from everything in their life being changed forever, just like you and I once were when somebody had a conversation with us or invited us, that you and I are indispensable. And as a church, I mean, think about it. our churches, you know, all of our campuses are where they are for a reason, because there's things that God wants to do. And God is at work in our community, is at work in people's lives, causing spiritual interest and spiritual thirst and pulling people to himself, always. And he asks us to join him. And that's important to remember because you can look at our world right now and think, I don't see God working. I mean, sometimes you see what you want to see, right? But, but you, you know, like reimagine is really a response to some big changes in our culture. Like, you know, we are, we're in this shift from being a predominantly Christian culture to a post-Christian culture, a relatively church culture to a, an unchurched culture. Uh, emerging generations, you know, uh, many, you know, largely kind of moving out of Christianity and repulsed by Christianity. And you can see that and think, oh no, it's all spiraling down. You know, what's happening? God's not working. And that's not true at all. God's very much at work. And I'm extremely optimistic. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will prevent, will not prevail against it. 
And I think what's happening in Christianity is sort of the death of cultural Christianity, an anemic Christianity, and what is rising up is a more authentic, vibrant Christianity that can actually is much more powerful to win over a skeptical world. But God is at work all around us. And, and to encourage us, we're going to be in this passage in John chapter 4 in the New Testament where Jesus is and, and his disciples go to this place, where, a whole region, Samaria, that for a number of reasons, they believe God is not interested in these people. Now, it's not true, but that's just what they'd been grown up teaching. They didn't like them. It's like what Texas fans would say about A&M people or something, right? It just, God's not interested in them or vice versa. But for, there was a, a bunch of deep reasons. But they, so they, they are in Samaria, this region, and they're thinking, oh man, let's just get out of here. This place creeps me out. You know, these people are evil. God doesn't want us here. God's not interested in these people. God's not at work here. They saw it as a spiritual desert. But Jesus, of course, didn't. He loved, these, he loved the Samaritans. He is God who created the Samaritans. He came to love and reach and connect to the Samaritans. And so here's what he sees. And we'll see the story, but here's kind of part of the punchline. He tells the disciples, um, because they don't know what's happening, um, when Jesus goes and he has this conversation with this woman, the woman goes to this village, a whole bunch of people come to know Jesus. They don't know that's happening. And so when they reconnect with Jesus, they just think, hey, let's get out of here. Jesus says, no, no, something's going on. And he says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Now, Samaria, if you've ever been there, is a desert. Like there's no fields. It's a desert. And so they'd be looking like, yeah, we don't see fields, right? But that's not what he's talking about. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and, a har and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower, the one who sows seeds, and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap for what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor, because they're about to go see the spiritual harvest as all these people have come to know Jesus. Because what happens next is what we'd all want to see. Now, the disciples couldn't see it. They didn't know that God was at work. They assumed he wasn't. And you and I can look at our world and think the same thing, but God is at work. And, and what happened then 2,000 years ago is a whole village comes to know Jesus. It's the first like mass conversion in Christianity. It, it's, the, it's, it's the biggest harvest in the history at that time in, in the whole of Jesus's ministry. It's this amazing Thing. And it's what you and I would want to happen in our culture. A, a major turning toward God. It's what some Christians call revival. Have you ever heard that? Christians use that word revival. And revival is just a, a mass turning to God. And even if you're a tire kicker, not a Christian yet, I mean, I think you would want that in our culture, right? Where you, a, a, Just a sense where a, a bunch of people believe they've found connection to God and become more like the Jesus we admire and change our world. I mean, that's what we would, I think that would be a good thing. And certainly for those of us who are believers, we'd say, yeah, that's exactly what we're praying for is a major turning to God. And that's what happened there. And God was at work then. And how is God doing that now? And I believe that you and I are indispensable to this process. And we're going to look back at the story, kind of go back in the story to say, well, how did that happen? Because it started small. It happened with a very small but powerful choice, and it's one of the small but powerful choices we believe God is calling us to make as we reimagine how we do church in a, whole new, in a whole new culture, in a whole new cultural situation, a whole new generation. And so if, you're, if you have a Bible, we'll be in John chapter 4. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. If you get to the New Testament, you're golden. Just the fourth book in. And here's where the story starts. Now he, Jesus had to go through Samaria. So geographically, Israel was divided into two halves, Galilee in the north, Judea in the south, and in the middle, it was split in half by this region called Samaria. And when it says now he had to go through Samaria, he actually didn't because most Jews hated Samaria so much, they hated the Samaritans so much, and vice versa, that they didn't ever go through Samaria, they went around Samaria. Even though it's geographically longer to go around, that's what they always did. So when it says Jesus had to go through Samaria, geographically, that's not true. And the disciples would have been like, why are we doing this? Why are we going through Samaria? And the reason he had to go through Samaria is not geographic, it's missional. This is a missional must. 
There is a divine appointment. There's somebody that he loves that he wants to connect to and he knows what's gonna happen and that's the must. Verse five. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Remember Joseph? If you were here last week, remember, whoa, whoa, baby, here we go, all the things that happened with Joseph. Well, that's Joseph, okay, same Joseph. Jacob, his dad, Jacob's well was there. Now, Jacob built that well 1,500 years before this, but it's still in use. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman replies, you are a Jew and I am a woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then John adds, for Jews do not uh, associate with Samaritans. So the disciples leave to go get food. Jesus sees this lady. She asks her for water. He says, she says, shocked that he's talking to her. How can you talk to me? Like, you don't talk to me. I mean, people like you don't talk to people like me. I'm, you know, she had two strikes against her that way. She was a woman and she was a Samaritan. I mean, first, she's a woman. Have you ever tried to talk to a woman? It's not easy, right? I mean, it's just, wow, that's not easy. <laughs> no, that's not the deal. Um, it was, in that culture, there were taboos about men and women and public and didn't know each other talking and and Jesus, it's interesting, but this would be a whole other sermon that I really do need to do, is how Jesus treated women so differently from their culture. Because he treated them with honor. He was friends with women. He had, uh, some of his followers were women, his chief, you know, and all that, part of his team. And he just not, he did not treat women the way his culture treated women. He elevated uh, women because he, you know, is God who loves women as much as men, right? And so all that, so he did not play by all those rules, he just considered them stupid. So of course he's gonna to talk to her. But she's also a Samaritan, and that's a racial cultural divide. And again, Jesus is above racial culture in cultural divides. His disciples had to learn that, and that would take a while. But you know, she's shocked, and he said, Yeah, I, of course I'm gonna to talk to you. And so they have this conversation. It's an incredible conversation. And we'll look at that later in the year. We'll do a sermon on that conversation. It's, a, it's one of the most fascinating conversations in the Bible. And the end result is she becomes a believer. She becomes a follower of Jesus. She gets so excited, she goes back. That's when the disciples come and have that conversation about the harvest. She goes back as they're coming in, tells her town. She's like, oh, you wouldn't believe who I met. And here's what happened. And here's the story. And this is God who came here. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior of the world. And, and all these people in the town believe and there's this massive turning to God from most of this village come to know Jesus. And Jesus goes and he stays there a few days to teach them what it means to follow him and all that connect with him. And it's just, it's this amazing story. But remember where it starts. It starts with a conversation in a place that's in the regular rhythm of her life, Jacob's well, that she went every day. What if the people around us adjacent to our lives were just one conversation away one invitation away, one prayer away, one act of love away from everything in their life changing forever. She had no idea when she went to that well what would happen that day. And what we wanna do in, as we look at reimagine is, is really learn from Jesus that way. She, Jesus was re, re, relating in a pre-church culture, a pre-Christian culture. We can learn from that in a post-church, increasingly post-church, post-Christian culture with the people that we're trying to reach. How do we reach them? Well, instead of asking them to meet us in the, where we are, in the regular rhythm of our lives, like a church service, how could we instead meet people where they are? She would have never met Jesus at the temple. Because as a Samaritan woman, she wouldn't have been allowed at the temple. That was messed up, but that's the way it was. He meets her where she is. And one of the big changes we're making and, and as we reimagine church for a new generation is to think, well, if we're gonna, in an increasingly post-church culture, people aren't waking up on Sunday morning thinking, where am I gonna go to church? So how do we meet them? Now, please understand the invitation to come sit with me in a series or church service is still a very powerful invitation. And eventually, people will get to that and that'll be really important. Increasingly, I think that'll be invitation two or three or four 
but we never know who's at a time when they're open to that. Uh, often it's when somebody's new, when somebody's going through a tough time. There's all kinds of reasons that God is at work and we have no idea where they're at. So I think always extending the invitation and many of you are here, I'm here, you're probably here because somebody invited you here. So it's a very powerful invitation. In fact, we had hundreds of people at Easter who responded and said, yeah, yeah come sit with me, come do it, and, and all that, right? And, and, and some of you are here now because you were invited. And so I, I don't want to minimize that. We will always do church in a way that makes it possible for us to invite our friends and invite our family to come sit with us and be able to connect and take steps with God. That's always going to be important. But increasingly important is going to be, even before that, an easier invite, an easier invitation. And that is, hey, can we rethink the way we do church to create Jacob's wells? Places that are already in the regular rhythm of people's lives, that we can meet them there. And so that's why in this Reimagine project, one of the things we're doing, one of the major components is to activate our spaces, is the way we're saying it, activate our spaces. And what that means is, how can we rethink the way we do even church buildings to say, you know what, we're not going to build church buildings anymore. And we're not. And we'll, I'll, I'll fill that in a little bit more. We're going to retrofit the ones we do. And when we start campuses, it's going to be different because we're reimagining church. So what do I mean by that? Well, by activating our spaces, it's saying, what if we used our church building? Because right now, church buildings are built around a, a weekend service, and it's used about once a week. It's kind of like NFL stadiums. But what if our buildings could be places where we met people, created Jacob's Wells, where people were there all the time? And, it, and, and people, and actually it, it connected people in our community and was a service to people in our community. And, and people are just around all over the place all the time. And that's what we're doing. So like here at our legacy campus, for those of you who are at that campus, we're starting retrofitting this campus first, then we'll go to the other ones. So it, that's why we're building local good coffee down here. And local good coffee is not just about, oh, it's a cool place for Christians to have coffee. That, that's really not the point. I mean, yeah, it will be a cool place for Christians to have coffee, but it's really a, a place for us to invite people in our world, invite people adjacent to our lives who may not know Jesus, who may not be part of the church. To, it's a much easier invitation to say, hey, come have coffee um, or come eat lunch or come eat breakfast or come eat because there'll be food there and stuff too. And it's designed to connect people to local good um, because, uh, and, and stories of local good. This is not, there's gonna be no sermons there, no, you know, anything like that. So I'm going to feel like going to church when you just go for coffee or go for lunch or go for breakfast and invite your friends there. But it will connect people to stories of local good. It's coffee with a cause. And it will connect people to a kind of Christianity that if you're outside of Christianity, you don't even know exists. Because all you know is what you see on media and in movies. and all. You have no idea what a genuine, authentic Christianity might be like. And so it'll be an, an invitation to that. Because coffee is in the regular rhythm of people's lives which I don't get because I think it's nasty, but most people seem to like it. When I became a Christian, God took that desire away from me. I, and so I was six years old, but still, you know, it's, um, no, I, you know, I'm sure it's great for some people. But, uh, um, and then, you know, if you go there, I mean, there's, there's a, there'll be a big play area out there too for families and, and all that to be able to connect to each other. It's going to be a lot of fun. Pickleball's there. Again, that's just not a place for Christians to play pickleball. That's a place it, that meets people in the regular. Pickleball is in the regular rhythm increasingly of people's lives. And so it'll be, it's an opportunity for our community to be able to engage. And, and, to, and to, uh, it, it's a service to them and for us to invite and all of that. And, uh, and so that's, that's local good. And then uh, we also, at our other campuses, want to do similar things. So at um, at our Woodbridge campus, uh, we'll be looking, and Todd can talk to you about that, and Ray, for those at Woodbridge, about how we're going to use the space there to uh, do ex similar to what we're doing here, to get people there and meet them in the regular rhythm of their life. Same thing at Sloan Creek, which will be more family-oriented, more next-gen oriented in there, and, and to connect families in that community, and, uh, and that'll be a fun experience to see how that goes. Also, we'll add daycare to all of our campuses. And the reason we're adding daycare, again, it's not, it's not just for Christians to have a place to do daycare. And that's going to be a little controversial, maybe, because um, you think, well, I want a discount or I want a whatever. And because, yeah, of course you can, you can use the daycare. Um, but the point of that is for our community. 
and for people who are not connected to church, not connected to Jesus, to, to, so that we can reach and, and connect to hundreds of people that we're not connecting with now and meet a need too. And so we're contracting with a daycare company that knows what they're doing, and, uh, and so they're the ones that are going to run it, but we'll be the faith component for that. And, uh, and that's contractual. So we will, uh, Kids Co. Will be, will be doing things there with those kids, introducing them to Jesus. We'll be able to invite those families and be there for families in times of difficulty, things like that. And so, and we'll do that at all of our campuses eventually. We'll start here at Legacy in about a month, I think, is when it, when it actually starts. Um, and then at Legacy also, we'll, we hope to add a chapel. And in uh, that chapel is where our Mandarin service will meet. But uh, it, it's also a time during the week that people can come and be with God in a different kind of sacred space. Um, but we'll do weddings and funerals there. But again, that's not only for us. That's also for our community. And we want to connect to our community in times of both celebration and tragedy and sorrow and, and very teachable moments in people's lives. And, and uh, so that's the chapel. And again, the whole point of that is how can we meet people in the regular rhythm of their lives? And as we start new campuses, we'll start with that in mind. And meaning we're not building church buildings anymore. We will build buildings and we will do church there. They're just not church buildings. And so here's what I mean by that. So think of a more like a strip center. Here's what maybe something like that could look. You'll see some images of that. Think of more like a strip center that maybe has a local good coffee depending on what's needed in that area. It could be a, a counseling center, lifeology counseling we partner with. It could be a co-working space. It could be sports stuff like we have here. Um, it, it, there definitely will be event space there. And that's where we'll do church on the weekends, but that event space will be designed to be rentable through the week and uh, by, for you know, businesses and other you know, government agencies and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's sort of like, so the front face of the church building will, or the, of the building will be where people connect all the time and are there all the time. But it's, hey, by the way, we, we do church here. Do you see the difference? It's a flipped paradigm a little bit. In addition to that flipped paradigm, um, a lot of those things actually generate revenue and generate income because uh, daycare will be at those new campuses too and uh, local good coffee and all that. And instead, in, in a flip paradigm, it's, we, we always use ministry dollars to pay for buildings. But what we wanna do is start using buildings to generate money for ministry and, uh, and to turn that into local good and turn that into ministry and to help it be self-sustaining and all that. So, um, so that's another flipped paradigm. Some people, we, we showed this picture a couple places just of an existing place. This is on 190, has a brass tap and a Mexican restaurant just to give a feel for, hey, it's kind of like this, you know, this kind of feel. And some people got really excited and some people got really mad because they thought we were gonna have a brass tap, that we were gonna have a bar. And uh, so some of you are like, oh, that's awesome. Some of you are like, that's terrible. I'm mad and all that. And um, I'm gonna pray hellfire down on you. And, um, but just so you know, this is irrelevant because that's not happening. We're not, it, it, these, we're not just renting it out to whoever. There's not gonna be a bar. Um, it's, it's Chase Oaks things like Chase Oaks, like local good counseling center, co-working space, all that. it's that kind of stuff. Okay. So don't get excited or mad and uh, sorry for the confusion if we caused it. Um, so that's activate our spaces. The next big part of the project is, uh, is to amplify local good. Uh, many of you know that our local good, like the local good center and local good pantry. I mean, they're incredible. And if you haven't volunteered yet, let me encourage you to, to do that. It is amazing. And the whole goal is lifting people out of poverty. And, and there's so many, when you look at the hundreds of thousands of people in our community, how can we come around those who are having a real difficult time and, and how can we uh, help bridge them to a life of flourishing and what's keeping them from that? And that's really what's behind uh, local good. And we want to be able in this project to expand local good. For one, have a local good resale shop where we can give away our stuff and turn that into ministry, turn that into blessing for other people, and also help that be sustaining financially. Um, there'll be other things, other ways we want to expand it. Also, our uh, local good food pantry in Richardson, I thought when I wrote this sermon, I said, it's amazing. We feed 4,000 people every month at, that, at our local good food pantry. And I found out yesterday, somebody said, why are you saying that? 
And uh, we feed 9,000 people every month. Can you, that's unbelievable. 9,000 insecure people, food insecure people. And we want to be able to operate that well and be able to, to, uh, ex, to, to expand our services there. And that's part of this project too. But in addition to those that we come around in terms of meeting needs, which is super important to us, it's also important to us. It's another way to reach our friends who, again, maybe not oriented around Jesus, not oriented around church and all that. An invitation for a lot of people, it's easier. Again, there's, the invitation to come sit with me is always a good invitation. But for some people, a lot of people, an easier invitation is, hey, come and serve with me. Because even if people don't go to church or not even think about going to church, they do want to make a difference in their world. And we make that easy. And it's not that easy if you don't have a way to make it easy. And so it's a great invitation to say, hey, come and serve with me. And, and come, we're going to do this thing. Bring your family. And by the way, if you're not like at Local Good Pantry, it's a great way to serve with your kids, with a family, and, and do that. Grow up that way. I mean, let your kids grow up that way and serving regularly and seeing you do that and all that. But you can invite neighbors. You can invite friends. And, and, and again, it's just a way to connect them to bumping around with people who know Jesus. And, and who knows what will happen, right, as, as that happens. And, and, uh, and I, I saw the power of that in COVID. Uh, we were, um, and I'm not going to say the word pivot. I'm not going to do that. And um, that's from last week. We're, we're, again, we're, we're pivoting away from pivot. That's, that's over. Um, but COVID, okay, we can say that. So uh, when I was in, uh, when we were in COVID, we were watching church with some friends who, uh, one of whom was not a, not a believer, not a Christian, not a church person, and kind of grew up with a very dark view of Christianity and bad experiences of Christianity. And then she's bumped into our family and she has a, she is more, way more open, right? And saying, man, I just never knew there was a church like Chase Oaks. She doesn't live here. She lives out of state, but she's fascinated by our church and all that we do in the community. And it's just like, wow, I, that's amazing. I didn't know that's what Christianity was. And it's just cool to see that. Well, this was in that process. So we're, and she's, she's, uh, she had watched Chase Oaks online uh, multiple times. And so we're all watching with her, our family, and we're on the couch and she's got the clicker for the TV. And I shared this story in the book, Rebranding Christianity. So this is going to be familiar and uh, just act like you haven't heard it if you have heard it. So we're, uh, so we're um, watching it, the service, and the announcements come on. And, uh, and we do what the Bible tells Christians to do when announcements come on, and that is to not pay attention, right? To start zoning out, right? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? No, you're not, okay? But, but you know, that we did. So we were, you know, so those of us, you know, my family, we started talking to each other. And she pauses the video and says, hey, would you not talk during this part? This is my favorite part. It's like, oh, we were chided. So she backs it up and see the whole thing. And I was a little wounded by that, the favorite part thing, because I was hoping her favorite part might be the sermon. You know, that just might be the sermon, <laughs> not the announcements, but oh well. So we get to the end of the service, or she's making, we're making lunch together, and, uh, and I said, hey, you said earlier, you know, that the announcements were your favorite part of the service, which is interesting to me. So, you know, why? And she said, oh, no, no, I like your part too. I said, no, no, you don't have to say that. I, um, and why? And she said, because that's where you talk about what you actually do in the community. And it is so cool what you do in the community to make a difference. And that's, that's what I look forward to. And I was thinking, wow, right? Because we have that in common. We don't have Jesus in common yet, but we do have the, the desire for the common good and to do good in the world, right? And so we can, uh, it, it just, it's a way to invite our friends and family and others into that. And so, yes, here's what we want to do in this project. We want to uh, uh, activate our spaces, we want to amplify local good. We also want to anchor the faith of the next generation, which is we're gonna talk about that next week. Don't miss next week if you care about the next generation. If you have kids, if you have grandkids, if you have nieces or nephews, because we're, we're talking about how do we pass the faith on to kids in our lives and the next generation of people in our, in our orbit, in our circle. And how can God use you and me? Because you are indispensable. Let's try that again. You are indispensable. I forgot to do it earlier. Yeah, you're indispensable and, uh, in, in that process. And so we'll talk about that. But you're also indispensable for this 
for everything we're talking about. Because again, remember the question. The question is, what if everyone around you, adjacent to your life, was one step, one conversation, one act of love, one invitation away from his or her life being changed forever? Because they are. And God has put you there whether you know it or not, for that reason. He loves people around you adjacent to your life so much. And and you'll hear me say the word church adjacent in in the future. I, to talk about people who are unchurched, because in the past I've just said unchurched or non-churched. But I was doing a a, a podcast. Uh, We do a rebranding Christianity podcast. And if you haven't listened to that yet, let me encourage you to do that. And start with about episode maybe 12 or 13, that's where we start interviewing other people. And they're just fascinating interviews about, hey, how can we think about Christianity differently? What is, what is God doing? And it, it's, it's really cool. So um, I was interviewing, and this will play in June, I was interviewing a guy named Bob Goff, who is a uh, author, best-selling author and speaker and just incredible guy. And so in that interview with Bob, he used the word church adjacent instead of unchurched. And I thought, that's good, church adjacent, because people who don't know Jesus, people who are not part of church or not part, they don't know it, but they're actually church adjacent. They're Jesus adjacent because of you and because of me. And they're just one little step away. And and the same thing is true for our churches and our campuses. I mean, think about the campus that you're at. If you're at Legacy, all the cars that drive by Legacy, if you're at Sloan Creek, all the cars that drive by Stacy Road, drive on Stacy Road by the church. If you're at Woodbridge, all the cars on 78, you know, just boom, 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 boom all the time. And they're just so close to everything in their life being changed forever. And that's why we wanna reimagine church to do that. And so when we talk about all the stuff that we're doing, please understand you are indispensable. And for this project, you're indispensable. And, and, and if you're up for this, here's what we're asking you to do. Here's how you're indispensable. The first one is inviting. Our strategy in doing all this stuff at our campus is not, if we build it, they'll come. It's not that easy. That's not the strategy. We are gonna build it, and we do hope they come, but you know why they come? If we invite them. And say, hey, come and, you know, let's play pickleball. Come and, you know, uh, Serve with me. Come and let's do this at local good. Uh, let's have coffee. Let's, you know, whatever. It's, it, it, this, remember, this is not just about us. This is not about a Christian bubble coffee shop. We don't want it to be a Christian bubble coffee shop. That's gross. What we want is to be a place where we can invite our friends and engage our community and, th- and be open arms to people in our community. And, um, and, and so, therefore, inviting is the way that's going to happen. And, and always keep it that in mind and always have an external focus in mind, not just, to, oh, this is mine. Um, no, this is not. It's our communities, right? Um, the second is by providing. And there I'm talking about giving and money. And, and I talked last week about that's gonna make some of you grumpy. And if you're in that deal, just you get a pass, okay? It's just, um, but some people are, really, you do. And I love you and I'm glad you're here and I get it. I mean, if you're new to our church, you're like, I don't trust you people. Um, you know, and okay, that, you know, just, you will one day, may, hopefully, maybe, you know, we'll earn that. But if, if that's not where you're at, you're kicking the tires of Christianity or something, I, I get that. So you get a pass. Um, but for those of us who are ready to say, man, I am part of this place. I, as a believer in Jesus, I want to honor God in this part of, in the financial area of my life. I want to be part of what our church is doing. Well, it's going to take all of us to do this. This is a $20 million project. That's a lot. It's a big step, and it's actually very achievable if we all do our part, and we all have different ability levels and all that kind of stuff, but if we, you know, some can give a whole lot, some this, and, and it all kind of balances out. We've done this over the years, and so I'm just going to invite you to be praying. In a few, in three weeks, we'll be making our pledges above and beyond our regular giving, what we believe God wants us to do financially for this project. And for those who participate, I'll tell you, it's the coolest thing ever. It really, and, and the first time we did it, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. And just to be honest, I was like, I mean, I'm excited, but at the same time, it's like, that's a lot of money. And I, you know, God, are you going to do that? How are we going to do that? And now I've been through five of these. And now after five of them, I'm not less excited. I am more excited because I've seen what God does and how he responds every time to a step of faith and sacrifice. 
And, uh, and so individually, I'm like, man, game on. Here we go. And, uh, and so we're praying about our number and, um, and asking God to keep stretching our faith and, and all of that. So we'll talk more about that later. But, um, but that's part of the deal. And so be praying about that now. Just start that process. And then serving um, to make all this happen uh, at local good, at all these things. I mean, it, it takes all of us to pull this off, and including what we're doing right now in these services and kids and students and all that. And if you are wondering, uh, man, I, I don't feel, I feel pretty, you know, I feel pretty dispensable. You're not. God has led you here and there's a role for you to serve. And there are things that won't happen in this church if you and I don't serve. It's just the way it is. And, uh, and, and there's huge opportunity and huge joy in actually taking that step. And at your campus, you can go to the hub and uh, talk about that. And, uh, and they'll help you to say, hey, yeah, where would I begin to serve? And how could I begin to serve? And, and that would be a great step and a great conversation because the way God has chosen to do things is through people like you and me. And some of you may feel very dispensable even now, even after all many times we've said indispensable because you're like, yeah, right. Like if you really knew me, if you really knew what I did yesterday, if you knew what's happened in my life to me over the years, if you knew what a screw up I am, you wouldn't say indispensable. I'm telling you what God chooses, when, when God chooses differently than people do, when God sees somebody that everybody just thinks is unqualified, God's like, that's perfect. That's the one I wanna hire because he loves to use people like me, mess, a mess on a mission and people maybe like you to do his work. It's just, the, that's what God, that's how God gets his kicks. I mean, that's just what he does. That's how he does things. And it takes all of us. And God's at work in the world. And just like Jesus said to the disciples when he's in John 4, when he said, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. You may not see it, just like the disciples didn't see it, but God can see it. There are people adjacent to your life and mine all around us that God loves, that he's working on, pulling toward himself, and that's why he has us in their lives. And so let's just ask God right now. We're gonna pray as a church to say, God, help us do that collectively as a church and individually. God, help me be intentional. Help me be focused. Help me make the invitations. Help me pray the prayers. Help me do the acts of love. God, help me be your person where you place me because you're indispensable. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Um, God, thank you that you love to use people like us to do your work. You don't just push us out of the way and say, hey, let a pro do it. You could, but you don't. And you love people around us so much that you've placed us where you've placed us in our school, in our work, wherever you've placed us, in our family. And God, would you help us to be faithful? God, as a church, that's a huge step for us. It's gonna take everybody, but even more than that, it's gonna take you to be the one that provides. And we know you are more than able. And so we ask that you will do that and give us the faith we need to do our part of this bigger project and help us to, as we reimagine church, it's your church. So give us the wisdom and give us the ability to do church the way you're calling us to do church, to reach a whole new world, a whole new generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're gonna sing that song, uh, we're gonna, More Than Able, because it's really, this whole series underneath it, you may not know it, it's Ephesians 3.20 is, is kind of an underpinning, because I haven't mentioned it yet, but it's the verse is, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Now think about that. He's able to do more than we ask, but that's not what it says, even more than we imagine. That's not what he says. He says he's able to do immeasurably. You can't even measure the difference between our wildest imagination and his ability. He's like, yeah, that's, that's little. Come on, do better. Be, think bigger. Take a bigger faith, step of faith because he's more than able. And as we walk into this new journey, we thought, you know, every journey needs a good pair of socks. <laughs> and since everybody here is indispensable, we wanted everybody to have that pair of socks to say, okay, let's, let's take steps together. 
And every time you wear them, just remind, oh yeah, God, you've called me to step into the future and what you're doing in the world, in this community, through our church. And so when you leave today, one per adult, just make sure you get um, some reimagined socks. And, uh, and thanks for being on the journey with us. Let's stand and sing to the God who is more than able.